All right. Good morning, everyone. And we can say it's good morning because it's it's morning. It is uh, morning. This, is, this is Kurt Verone. And Brad Pinsky. And we're here for another edition of File Law Roundup, this time for January 8th of 2024. Okay, our second Yay. show for 2024. And Brad, go ahead. Take us away. So, I, you know, I'm just going to end the year right here. Because this first story is so great. I'm just, you know, we, we've pretty much satisfied my need to cover anything more. Um, we're going to go to Nashville. And please, everybody needs to, after this, stop watching and go back to the newsreel and watch the video. Um, now, these are allegations. These are charges. I'm just saying, right, this. But if true, Jesus. Um, so uh, here are the allegations. A Nashville firefighter. Um, he's facing criminal charges, as if true, he should. Um, he's he's off duty. Um, uh, this is a 31 year old individual. He's off duty. He's now charged with five counts of reckless endangerment, one count of disorderly conduct. I am guessing that this state, maybe maybe Tennessee, doesn't have a interfering with firefighter operations or it's charged, but he's he's on the scene of a building fire off duty he's barking orders allegedly and telling firefighters they're doing things in incorrectly um and then he offers to help and his offer shockingly is declined um he then you know well rather than leave well enough alone he um then takes gear out of a truck and an scba um, gears up, enters the building, and starts giving orders. Um, and on that, I'm out. This year's yeah. over. I that is the greatest story ever. Um, if true, if true. Uh, so he was arrested. Uh, shocking. Um, and um, I, I, I don't want to comment any further because I'm just going to get in trouble with anything. It's, I yeah, and it, it's hard to speculate as to what. You know, uh, wh whether there were, um, you know, other things going on, such as, you know, uh, drinking or, um, you know, recreational uh, medications, you, you you don't know. You don't or know. Crazy. One of the, well, one of the things that that uh, and, and they didn't say it in the article, but so I'm speculating here. But in terms of whether or not he used to be a member of that department uh, and um, but she's, you know, um, you know, it's 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 kind of and Nashville's Nashville is a a big time fire department. OK, it's 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 like somebody at the Boston Red Sox going in and kind of getting involved in a in a high school game. You know, I mean, uh, you, you know what? What in God's name are you think? And I don't mean to insult the Rutherford County Fire Department. I don't mean that. But, geez, you know, you're talking about a metro and that might have been part of part of the problem as well. Uh, but who, who knows? Just um yeah, it goes on the top of you can't make this stuff up. You know, I, and I, 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 <laughs> I, I get the point of he's, you know, he's yelling things. Um, OK, that's crazy enough. But then to gear up and go in. <laughs> yeah, I, so, I oh, well. don't know. I don't know. Uh, really unfortunate, what? unfortunate situation that a firefighter now is facing criminal charges. And, you know, certainly I'm, I'm sure there's going to be um, employment uh, consequences with Nashville as well. That, that certainly doesn't help, yeah. um, you know, the cooperative nature that we need to have with some of our mutual aid partners and, and colleagues. So yeah, my legal advice is don't ever do this. <laughs> yeah, don't don't do that. Don't don't do okay, that. Okay, well, yeah, yeah, well, I think I think part of the you know, like the old backdraft movie, um, yeah. you're, not, you're not doing it right, you know. Right. I think that might have well, <laughs> you know, to to uh to the firefighter involved, you're not doing it right. Just you know, yeah. just don't do take, that. Take notes and you know, so you don't do that if you're in this that situation, but don't interfere. Yeah, but, nobody's that important. <sighs> yeah. So yeah, so, wow. Yeah, okay. so I, I thought this was going to be the the crazy one when I when I when I put it in there the the wheel chalk case. Oh yeah, and <laughs> and you know, and I need more background. But so let's yeah. do that. Let's cover San Jose, and and this is look. I'll I'll summarize this. So there's a lawsuit, a valid lawsuit potentially, mm -hmm. um, and you'll have to describe because I'm not totally sure how the wheel chalk whether it. Well, let me let me just yeah. summarize the case first for everybody. This is a good lesson in if you're going to sue a municipality, A, you better know who it is 
uh, that you're suing. And uh, there's A, B, C. A, know who you're sue, suing. B, you better pay attention to the government. And pretty much every state has one. I'll explain why. To mm -hmm. their sovereign immunity waiver statute. Uh, and C, um, if you don't sue on time, you better have a valid excuse. So um, the the every state requires probably has a sovereign immunity. It means you can't sue the king. Mm -hmm. And it says you can only sue if you sue in the manner we allow you to sue in, right? And most states have 90, 120, in this case, six six months, right? Usually it's 90 days or 120 days. You got to give notice of a lawsuit. Here, very, very generous six months to time to sue. Mm -hmm. um, and the plaintiff's attorney allegedly screws it up uh, maybe you have a good malpractice case here, but um, in any event, they don't sue the right entity in time and then say, ah, it took us so long to figure it out. And it looks like there's some blame going to the attorney or saying my attorney screwed up. Well, the, the general rule is law office failure is not an excuse to serving a claim on time. And law office failure in this case is, well, you should have known who it was, through, uh, who you were supposed to sue through a diligent effort. They sued the county um, or well, they, whoever. They, sue, they, they, they sent notice to the county well, and to the state. But what we had was a park and it looks like, number one, it was a city park. So it wasn't a county park. Uh, or was it a county park? Well, that's what I'm getting wrong. It, yeah. The, it, so it matters problem, who the truck was owned by, effectively. It, it, it does. It does. But the property owner as well. And I think they may have been confused. Now, I thought it said that the it was a city. I know in some of the documents I saw, it said it was a city park. Um, but uh, the the quoted part there talks about a county park. But it, it, regardless, there the person is hiking in a park. Um, a fire truck is in the area. And I don't know how this happened, but we have a wheel chalk that I guess becomes airborne. It was ejected, so I'm assuming somebody spun the wheels or whatever. What it seems uh, you know, like, it doesn't seem like it's going to fly out of the, you know, the wheel chock storage compartment. compartment. Yeah, yeah. So, and and the person gets struck. Okay, so now the question becomes, who who's responsible? You could say, well, the property owner. So if it's a county park, you could say the property owner. Um, you could say the uh, apparatus, the driver, and so on. But they sent notice to the wrong party. They didn't send it to the city. It was a city fire truck. There was a police report about what happened uh, that pretty clearly said it was a city park and that it was a city uh, vehicle. Uh, and they sent the notice of claim within the time frame to the county and the state. And um, they also, interestingly, the, the county got back to them within the time frame and said, it's not us. That and, should have been, right? Right. Been well, then, me. but that prompted the attorney or whoever to send a letter. And I'm assuming it was an attorney, but who, who knows? So, you know, there's some places right. that there's, there's people that um, are not attorneys that uh, help people with lawsuits. So, yeah, it's kind of. Get what you pay for. Yeah. And at any rate, um, they sent a letter to the, to the city attorney, uh, but that's not a claim. That's not a notice of claim. Right. And um, that the court basically said you did not follow the statute uh, to file a proper claim. And and listen, the, these to anybody who thinks you're going to get away with screwing this up, you're mm -hmm. not. This is very tough. And what happens is when you um, miss the deadline, you have to go back and ask the court for permission to file a late claim. You then have to prove merit. Among other things, uh, among other, you have to prove there's no prejudice to the party from this delay. You have to prove that um, you had a reasonable excuse and law office failure is not. We didn't know what was. Yeah, well, let's and, let's give it. Let's give an example. I'll give you one is if okay. she was knocked unconscious and in a coma. That would be OK. She'd have an that, excuse. That, that would be, a, a, a you know, a, a reason for them to uh, waive the, the time frame. Right. If the trucks were mislabeled, so they misled her. Right. right. Um, there's not a lot of excuse. Uh, but mm -hmm. here the court is even saying, look, you, you could have figured it out early. You figured it mm -hmm. out now. You could have done these same things through exercising reasonable diligence. Right. So excuse is a big deal. Um, lack of merit. Um, 
is is a way and now some states are different but it, generally you have to establish merit or they can attack you for absolute lack of merit there there's a couple ways these different states i don't know about california but either way when you miss the deadline these deadlines were put in place by the state so they're very tough to overcome very tough to overcome. And this is true if you're suing a city, a fire district, any municipality where they've waived, the state has waived the right for you to sue them, they put in place these protections. And one of them is, and there's a reason. The reason is the municipality has the right to be able to investigate. So you have to say within a short amount of time, 90 days and some six months to file whatever, um, that you know you have to say, well, we gave you the opportunity to investigate. And when we didn't give you that opportunity, that you weren't were not prejudiced by our um, failure to give you the ability to investigate. And there is even a very uh, famous uh, quote in our uh, state in New York that says, even by dint of luck, I didn't even know what dint meant, but nonetheless, even by dint of luck, if you happen to uncover the facts, that's not enough. They still have to give you the ability to investigate. And when you take away the ability to investigate, that's going to prejudice the municipality and they're not going to, the court is not going to allow you to sue. So mm -hmm. don't miss these deadlines. And I will tell you, as in New York, I play this all the time because it practically uh, is a very good defense tactic. They give you wrong notice. They sue the wrong party. I have it all the time. A lot of times they sue the fire company, but on the other hand, it's supposed to be the fire district who got sued or the town who got sued. And they serve the wrong party because municipalities don't know and or lawyers don't know. And we talk about on this show, we've talked a lot about the shotgun approach. We sue everybody. The reason is so you don't miss the right party and have this problem. So mm -hmm. if you are a plaintiff and you're going to sue a fire department, look, we hope you don't. But um, you better get the right one. Or you get better get the right municipality or whatever. Yeah, and this this can also happen when a firefighter gets hurt, and for whatever reason they're not going under workers' comp or whatever, but they're going to go after a municipality. So it's not, you know, sometimes we think of the, you know, we're the boogeyman because you sue a fire department, but sometimes the victim in a in a case is a firefighter. Uh, right. Could be a firefighter from one fire department suing a suing a different fire department. So and look, sadly here, this probably was a pretty good lawsuit. Now, I don't know what the immunity yeah. statutes, even though we see see them all the time in California would be like, but, you know, this probably was negligence, whether it was gross negligence or recklessness, but it could have been, think of it, those wheel chocks, right? Are you, you're putting, it's a loop or it's a, or it's a, you know, maybe there's two of them or just one of them, but if you're going forward and you're revving the engine to get over this, you should be, you should know as an operator, wait a minute, one, I probably should have walked around right? To, to look, to make sure I put them back in. Okay. That's negligence, right? And maybe you violated a policy, but when you're revving the engine to get up over the chalk, which is stopping you from moving, then you should know that, geez, I really revving this engine hard to get up something. And then it shoots out. Maybe that is gross negligence. Maybe that was willful or wanton conduct, right? Who knows? That's a jury question, but maybe. Um, but, I, you know, that would have been a good potential lawsuit. And uh, the person who screwed up, be it the attorney or whatever, may end up answering for that. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so, and just so everyone knows, what would happen if they sue the attorney? Well, if the attorney, the attorney's certainly law. Uh, is certainly responsible for screwing up. If that's the case, then you get that part. But normally in an attorney malpractice, you have to prove that you could win the suit. So what happens, it becomes very interesting here. Now, the fire department's no longer on the hook, but the fire department may need to cooperate in the malpractice suit. And now the fire department's saying, you know, we're not on the hook anymore. We could say, yup, we screwed up. You're negligent. Now your attorney has to pay because we feel badly. Who knows? I mean, it's it's um, and the attorney has to go to the opposite because now the attorney's got to say, uh, well, uh, it it really wasn't that meritorious a case, you know, and, right. and, and right. we couldn't have, and we couldn't have won. And now the the roles are flipped. Yeah, right. And we we should have just fi yes, we should have filed, but it wouldn't have mattered. And that's why I gave it for the investigation sort of. Yeah, that, it, very interesting when you're in that flipping sort of situation. Okay, let's go to uh, Florida. 
um, which at the moment is where I'd love to go because I'm staring <laughs> at about three feet of snow outside. I'm so, loving it. We've we've only got six inches, but I'm loving it. I'm Jesus. Uh, yeah. yeah. I wish I, I should turn my camera. I'm I'm gonna do this. Here, ready? I'm gonna take my camera and I'm gonna face it outside. And that is what I'm looking at. We're looking at banks oh, of snow all over the place. Yep. So okay. Anyway, I love that I could do that. Um, okay, so anyway, let's go to Florida. Um this is a very nice judge. I th the lesson of this is if you think you're going to get this nice of judge uh three times out the gate you're 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 not. Um in any event all we have here is we have a and maybe there's more that I'm not understanding but we have a chief who claims he was wrongfully terminated. Let me give you the top level view. We'll get a little deeper. Um he's filed now two or three times. He has not made out um, the proper elements of the suit there. It looks like there's been two motions to dismiss and the judge has granted them, but not with prejudice. The, the judges said, listen, plaintiff would be plaintiff. We'll allow you to come back and file if you can make the elements out of a claim. But um, he's getting warned by this court like this. I don't think you can succeed, but I'm going to give you every opportunity I can. This is a very nice judge. There are not a lot of judges who'd say you file once or twice or, you know, I'll give you a third time. Uh, you keep screwing it up. I don't know if he has an attorney or if he's doing this on his own or what's happening. But he's I, I believe he's got an attorney. But I, I again, I don't know all the details. And it's really more about I think it's more about pleading. I don't think it's so much about the merits of the case, but he just he hasn't pled the elements of the the legal theories properly. And the judge, I think, is you're, you're right. The judge is sort of bending over backwards to say, all right, you know, you know, just add those elements in. You're missing some elements here. Add those elements yeah. in. And I don't know whether the facts would allow it, but I mean, it, it and the facts are kind of uh, kind of confusing. So the, this guy says, listen, I, I, I'm i serving as a chief and I received a written warning for something that I shouldn't have received a written warning for. Um, and there, the question, it's a question of fact over what he really said, but it's no question that he did receive a written warning about how he what he said or how he reacted to something it's a little confusing but basically he's saying that i received a warning that i engaged in some racially motivated speech um and as a result i it started off you know you get a warning and that warning serves as basis in later discipline right mm -hmm. for um, and, and I'm going to open a bigger can of worms on this. I really want to, but, um, you receive a written warning, you don't challenge it, or you're not allowed to challenge it in many areas. You're not allowed to challenge it. And yet it becomes part of your disciplinary record. And now when something later happens, we say, oh, but you've got this other thing that happened to you, right? You've got a disciplinary history. Um, and now we have a reason to terminate you because this is the second time something happened. Um, so I, you know, and that that to me is a more interesting issue uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of states or a lot of times you don't get to challenge the written warning because it's just a letter that goes into your file and sign here, acknowledge it. And you don't get the a hearing, which I the think Supreme is wrong. Court, the Supreme Court refers to it as what uh, what we refer to as a trivial deprivation. Yeah, so and I not, disagree with that because yeah, that's right. Too. That's not how too. it plays out in real life. Yeah. Um, but you know, you get two. Yeah. Two of these in your file, three of these in your file, and then something more serious happens like, well, this is a third, fourth time. Yeah. Um, but here, I, I don't know what's happening where he's just not sufficiently alleging the facts, making out the elements. You know, we have two cases now where maybe it's the attorney issue. But look, law is hard, people, right? Yeah. Law is complicated. Law is hard. So you need to know how to draft a complaint. You need to know how to, you know, uh, comply with time and notice requirements. Law is hard. And, you know, we dealt with the notice requirements before. This one is about you need to know how to make out the elements of a complaint. And if you don't do it right, you know, correctly, it's getting thrown out. And don't think that judges are going to give you three chances like this judge does. Kudos to this judge, even though he said, I don't think he can make it out. I don't think he'll survive, but I'm going to give you the opportunity. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much more you want to get into this, but the yeah, it's 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 confusing, and uh, you know it is what it is. But folks that are interested in it, uh, certainly, uh, we got some friends down in Palm Beach County, and uh, you know you could take a look at uh, what the court said, and you know 
And I'm happy to come down there now and visit and talk about in person if you if you want to. It's it's but, you know, really the lesson on this is, you know, when you're drafting a complaint, you need elements made out properly and you need to do that to meet the elements of a cause of action. And here they're not doing that. Um, but, uh, and the other part is I, I really don't like, I hate written warnings. I think they're unfair. I, I don't think there's anything like a trivial written warning because they all come back to haunt you and I've used them and, you know, I've used them. I've defended against them. And it's like, wait a minute, I didn't get to, I didn't get a hearing on the written warning. You're just giving me written warnings. I get no way to defend myself. And New York is split. I will say, I don't know what the law is in every other state, but in New York, we're split. And um, civil service, one some lines say you have to give a hearing because it goes in your file. Other cases say, no, it's trivial, not a big deal. We're not going to give you a hearing for every trivial thing you do, except it matters. It adds up. Well, we'll throw out a, a term here, the louder mill idea, the louder mill hearing. Louder mill hearing is uh, an opportunity to be heard but it's not really an opportunity to present evidence. It's really just you're, you're confronted with the allegations and you're given the opportunity to explain or rebut. And that's a constitutional requirement that's necessary even for a reprimand. You cannot give somebody a reprimand without their involvement, without them being aware of it and without them having an opportunity to respond. Um, so you would have the opportunity for that. And they don't refer to that as a louder mill hearing. Louder mill is really for a termination, but you have at least the opportunity to be heard. Um, and But you don't really have the option to challenge that factually by bringing in evidence and witnesses and so on. So you, you could say it wasn't me or I didn't say that or whatever. At the end of the day, if you get the reprimand, you get the reprimand. Right. But... Um, I think the the better approach, the approach I, I try to take is when we're dealing with this, we're saying, OK, um, you did A, B and C. Um, we believe that, you know, you know, this warrants a, a harsher suspension. You know, we could suspend you for 48 hours. However, if you waive your right to appeal, uh, we, we're just going to we're going to leave it at a reprimand. OK, and then that way, that way, at least you have the opportunity uh, to appeal. So this is, no, I'm not going to take that. I didn't do it. And OK, now we go for a, you know, now we have the opportunity for a hearing. But when you start out with the reprimand there, you know, in many places and, and you know, really, what's what's the harm? Let, you know, let right. you know, I mean, be right. be fair uh, and give the person the opportunity to, you know, air their concerns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of places are like, you know, it's too much work. We don't want to do that. We're just going to, you know, put a letter in your file, written warning or a, a written con confirmation of a verbal warning, which seems like a written warning. Um, but, you know, but but this stuff adds up. And worse now, um, in New York, at least, that's all I could speak about as to this very specific issue, fire, paid firefighters and paid police, when they pled to crimes, they or pled to violations, not crimes, <laughs> pled to violations of, you know, workplace conduct or whatever, uh, or discipline, or they accepted discipline, or they accepted a smaller discipline, so they could avoid higher discipline, whatever it was, that was protected from public disclosure. Now, um, yeah. you know, in the last couple of years, New York got rid of it and said, nope, it's all public. The only thing except for technical infractions, which is not uh, disclosable. Everything else is disclosable to public record. And there are these agencies, as you probably know, that are making thousands of requests for everybody's, you know, disciplinary history. And it, it's, well, it's, it's wreaking havoc on, you know, the availability to get anything done in police departments because they're responding to all these requests for information, but it comes back to haunt police. And, and worse now, the state's highest court has accept, has taken up the question is not heard argument to my knowledge yet, but on whether pre-2020, that's when this uh, they changed the law, before 2020, had I pled guilty or I pled, you know, I accepted discipline, pled guilty discipline because I thought it was going to be public. Is that now, uh, I thought it was going to be private. Sure. Is that now yeah. public record? And the court, uh, two, there are four appellate divisions in New York State, two, they've gone each way. Some say, well, wait a minute, it was prior to 2020, you thought it was going to be private. And so you accepted a settlement, et cetera. We're going to keep that private. Others say it doesn't matter. The law says it's public, it's public. Um, so, you know, your discipline matters when you, ex if you're just, something goes in your file is my point, and you don't get a chance to challenge it, it matters because now it could be public record 
for you and and, and especially really, if you go somewhere you know there's another another part to that and uh if many times something goes in somebody's record for a period of time maybe a year two years or, or whatever if someone has access to that when it was a public record when it was there and now it's gone but now the record is still there permanent um yeah so now you know so uh again i think a lot of this was in response to some of the uh the social justice uh issues that that came out uh after certainly michael brown and then george floyd it and is, it, it was sort of like an overreaction i think a lot of folks are realizing holy cow we've got all sorts of other problems now that uh, were created with the best of intentions, uh, but uh, have been created. And this is, is certainly, you know, lumping firefighters in there with with law enforcement uh, certainly is why we're talking about it. But yep. uh, it's uh, it's a big yeah, challenge. When I, when when I was chief, we negotiated dis a disciplinary process with our union that mm -hmm. uh, we said, look, uh, something will go in your file for six months or a year, depending on what it is. And mm -hmm. once that time passes, yeah, it's out, which is a nice, easy way to say, OK, a written warning won't permanently harm you forever. And right. for that reason, now that's out the door, right? Anybody requests yeah. it, it. That's a great point. It, it just it it takes away so many convenient disciplinary options for employers and employees. And now everything's got to be a union fight because, gee, somebody could get a hold of that. Um, yeah. I know we just took that whole case and moved it forward <laughs> to something it wasn't, but I think we made it more interesting. So, yeah. um, but that's uh, that's our week. Yeah. Well, we got one more of that Houston case. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, Houston. I'm happy Houston. To, yeah, Houston and. Uh, um, I, this is an interesting Houston. I've got a lot of friends down in Houston and I, you know, I know that they've been through hell the last eight to 10 years, um, in, in terms of their pay, uh, they, there's, uh, there was a, um, charter amendment. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not sure of the time frames. So I know it was at least five or six years ago, but there's a charter amendment, uh, and historically there'd already been, pa there's always been parity between police and fire. Uh, police started getting ahead of fire for a couple of reasons, but bottom line is police were ahead of fire. Um, and so there was a charter amendment to fix that so that they were going to, there was going to be parity going forward. Um, the, uh, amendment passed the, the local, uh, local, uh, uh, 341, um, supported the charter amendment. It was passed. Uh, and then the city refused to honor it. And there was lawsuits and the firefighters had to sue. Then you had the city suing the fire department, the city suing the firefighters. And um, uh, there was a just a, a lot of frustration. I just the, the number of lawsuits skyrocketed in Houston. And it's it's not when these we have these types of labor management warfare. Um, certainly you have lawsuits between the, the union and the city and, and back and forth. But you also see a lot of other types of litigation. You have a couple of firefighters here and there filing an FLSA suit. You have another couple of firefighters filing about something else. It's, it's, it's almost like you can look at lawsuits as a barometer for how things are going within the culture of the fire department. And when there's That's problems... True lawsuits go up so bottom line is the article here is on uh the inauguration of a new mayor who has a open commitment um to supporting the firefighters and ending all of this uh, acrimony and uh, i thought it was really interesting just because of the volume of litigation coming out of uh houston for, on the firefighters i can't speak to teachers or police or anybody else but when it comes to firefighters, the volume of litigation is just um, it's 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 heartbreaking for me. And, um, you know, the courts are not the way to move a, an organization forward. They're not. It's it's really it's it's an indication of dysfunction. And so uh, I'm really glad to see uh, that uh, the the mayor has come out of uh, the new mayor uh, has come out and he certainly was elected uh, with the support of the firefighters. And you can watch a couple of videos there. But one of them, uh, the mayor actually talks about uh, how he is going to treat the firefighters better going forward. And I added an update in there in that the mayor has told the city's law department end this litigation. This that's it. And the litigation. This is litigation the city filed against the union. 
So, uh, you know, certainly there's going to be a financial tab um, that goes along with the settlement of these. But uh, on the other hand, there's a financial tab that goes along with continued litigation. And I, I really it'd be interesting to go back and look at how much the city has had to spend on litigation uh, versus what, it you know, if they had just uh, honored the, the firefighters uh, claims right from the start, uh, you know, whether or not the taxpayers would have been better off, because now at the end of the day, they're going to end up settling it anyway. So really, I'm, I'm happy for the folks in Houston. And I hope this is really, you know, the start of a new chapter uh, in the Houston Fire Department. Yeah. And, you know, look, it's bad for morale and this is good for morale as yeah. as the news story is already reflecting morale. Morale's up, you know, happy you... people don't file lawsuits. Not usually. No, that's yes. definitely true. That's <laughs> that's definitely true. And, uh, you know, most most people like to work those things out when they can. And uh, you know. Uh, you know. so, again, I say uh, lawsuits are a barometer uh, of of dysfunction in an organization, you know, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. True. So, Very true. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, that's going to do it for another edition of File Law Roundup. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Brad, I know you got a little trip coming up, but uh, we'll see.